to formally introduce P. Sainath to this audience. Sainath was a contemporary of mine in this very campus itself. We were both student activists. We were, of course, on the opposite side of the political divide. Sainath was a towering figure of the then most powerful student organization of the campus, Student Federation of India. I and Sunil, whose memorial lecture Sainath is scheduled to deliver in a while. Sambhunath Singh and many others were present here, formed a very local, campus-based organization. We call it Students for Democratic Socialism. But later, at the insistence of Sunil, we changed the name to Samata Yuvajan Sabha. We believed that we have a different ideological position vis-a-vis -vis the SFI, which subscribed to the communist framework. But Sunil always used to insist our goals are same. We all stand for the poor and the underprivileged. In this campus, we used to admire quite a few SFI activists who were very well read and at the same time extremely articulate. Sainath was a signing example of that category of leaders. But Sainath really glowed when he left the campus and entered the professional life. He made a mark as a crusading journalist. We used to read his biting pieces in R.K. Karanjia's Bliss. K. Abbas, the filmmaker, used to write a column called Last Page. It was a phenomenal column and that ran for decades. When he was about to die, K. Abbas wrote a will and requested Rishi Karanjia, please give my column to someone like Sainath who will be able to carry on the K. Abbas tradition. Sainath truly came to national recognition then. Sainath's finest hour, of course, came when he did those disquieting pieces from the 10 poorest districts of India for the Times of India. I sometimes wonder how the TOI bosses agreed to fund that project and published those pieces so prominently in that newspaper. That was in 1990s. In 1990s, I was working with the Times of India Delhi. I was with the edit page. I remember one day, we were called to the upper stairs where the chamber of the big bosses were there. And there, the all-powerful corporate director, who is unfortunately no more, in the presence of uh, the then editor, who is also no more, told us 
very categorically if you want to write about poverty about disease about suffering this is not your place we want to position the delhi times of india as a happiness inducing morning paper we do not have the place for the kill joys in our metro editions if you want to write this quit or go to our original editions with this distinct mandate from the ti top bosses sign out rob not writing reports where something which should have sounded a completely discordant note but surprisingly the ti management embraced it with an open arm i don't know how but maybe sainath will throw some light on this during his lecture my hunch is the power of his research the depth of his field work and the force of his argument must have drawn a sizable chunk of readership for the times of india the ti bosses possibly made an exception for sainath's incisive writings only because in his case good journalism made good business as you all know sainath's book everybody loves a good drought based on those tui reports brought him international laurels then he joined the hindu his penetrative analytical pieces in the hindu has become a trend setter the crowning glory of course was the magasese award for fearless fearless journalism in 2008 i think sainath was possibly the second indian to get this honor after the iconic cartoonist r k lakshman Sainath's current engagements with Puri, People's Archives of Rural India, is a unique initiative, which has drawn people from different backgrounds to be part of it and to own a part of it. It's indeed a trailblazer. I mentioned only a few of Sainath's major accomplishments here. about which i had i have had personal knowledge but sainath's reporter of achievements is much much larger i googled to check what kind of awards sainath has received in all these years and more important what kind of awards domestic or international he has rejected on ideological or moral grounds they are so numerous i just couldn't count them anyway those are available on the internet i don't need to recount them here one thing that comes out very sharply from all the commentaries on sainath's career here is a journalist who remained stayed first to the vocation of free and fearless journalism a rarity in today's corporate controlled media <clears throat> sainath was the first choice of the trustees of the sunil memorial trust to deliver the annual lecture this year we have been organizing this lectures in sunil's memory every november this is the ninth lecture we had luminaries like sekar patak sunita narayan 
Ramchandra Guha, Gopal Krishna Gandhi, Justice Modern Lakur, and last time it was Ravish Kumar, who all have delivered this lecture in this platform in the past. When I spoke to Sainath last month to do Dhanas this year, he readily agreed. Last two lectures of this trust were online because of the COVID restrictions. But Sainath agreed for an in-person meeting. In fact, he showed greater interest that he wanted to interact with the youngsters. So we are organizing this lecture just two days after his book, The Last Heroes, was released in the India International Center on Monday. That Monday night, I was also there. And one could see Sainath's massive fan following. The hall was jam-packed. Many were sitting on the floor, like here, and quite a few were standing at the back. In fact, I met so many friends of yesteryears. We, we all constitute the first decade of Janeites, and we, I felt that was an alumni meet of the first decade Janeite group. It is now, today, the turn of the youngsters to turn this place to listen to this legendary journalist and, so to speak, a conscience keeper of this nation. Some Sainath's appeal clearly crosses all boundaries, all generations. I have stood long enough between the erudite speaker and the eager audience. I must rest my case here. Over to sign out. Thank you very much. I'm absolutely honored to be delivering a lecture in memory of Sunil. Uh, it really is an honor. And I, uh, no, I, I prefer this. Yeah. Yeah, OK. It really is an honor. And I thank the organizers for asking me to do this lecture. It's also great to be back in JNU. Yes, as uh, Mohanty said, we were contemporaries. There are others from that time I see contemporaries sitting here. I was in room 341, Ganga. <laughs> and, and in room, room 330, look, in those days, Ganga was a men's hostel. <laughs> And uh, and we were such a bloody nuisance. I think after we left, they did a havan and converted it to a women's hostel. <laughs> but I'm told, I'm reliably assured that they did not get the, you know, quiescent obedience that they wanted. I'm, I'm glad. I think it has something to do with that hostel. In, I was in 341. And in room, room 339 was occupied by a harmonium to which was attached one Shubendu Ghosh. <laughs> uh, anyway, it, it's great to be back. The, I, I last uh, was here in, in a public lecture at the, at the time of Kanaya's arrest in 2016. And you can all hear me, right? Any problem? Ah, yeah. They can hear. Okay. Uh, <coughs> Nandi was asking about what happened at TOI that they agreed. One, I think I was very lucky, very frankly. Two, there were many things going. One is that on the pl plus side, the series in Mumbai 
received a record number of readers letters a a owner of a small lock shop in aligarh in 1993 was sending 5000 rupees in the mail for a toddy tapper in tamil nadu you know a few lakhs of rupees came in and we didn't know what to do i was trying to tell them you have to your some of the people i wrote about didn't have bank accounts how the heck am i going to deliver it to them but that kind of response i think influenced them also i think i came at the correct time i was lucky to come at the correct time because i think from 91 to 94 the at a large section of the readership of the newspaper were really fed up with what they were getting you know it was the time of uh, it was the time of india's great heroic successes in miss world and miss universe and in the times anything any page you open you know miss world would be opening a health clinic or giving away the prizes at a sports function you know it was every and then i remember at that time there was no nd tv alas again today there is no nd tv there was nd tv for star news and star news had other plans and they also were you know they looked at what's going on in the times of india and called me for a thing panel on uh, in which this miss world miss universe thing came up because it became it, it became mandatory for every miss world and miss universe to say that i want to do the same things as mother teresa <laughs> so so then the anchor asked me by the way my my clip was never aired the anchor asked me isn't that wonderful um uh, that you know these girls are sh showing that conscience i mean they were all carefully coached by the times uh, you know the the femina miss india show and all that isn't it wonderful that these girls are showing such a conscience they all want to do the same thing as mother teresa i said you know absolutely but uh, the only way they are going to do the same things as mother teresa is uh, for mother teresa to enter a beauty contest <laughs> <laughs> and and she better hurry up time's running out <laughs> the clip vanished when the thing when the thing was aired <laughs> okay but so i think that there was also a little backlash a reaction to the amount of you know faff that was coming in the newspapers anyway about today um and the fact is that daryl de monte was a daring editor and padgonkar allowed him that space to experiment and do things and once the re and another thing was ashok jain was alive he was very pleased and that fellowship was in his father's name so when he started getting feedback from ministers and top bureaucrats he thought this is a good thing you will note that i never joined the times of india <laughs> i was just a fellow and uh, yeah so in this there is no way that i'm going to be able to cover more than fragments of this gigantic subject of inequality because in india we don't have inequality we have inequalities in plural and in caps yeah so a few i i i would rather talk about a couple of aspects of it which i think i have numbers or oh, the last time i spoke in 2016 at that sit in i also spoke on inequality and uh, just i was just thinking today that all the numbers have trebled some of them have quadrupled uh the government of india is presently engaged in a war on all those who create indexes globally because you see the thing is we are all such wonderful people that the whole world is jealous of us right 
So in every nook and cranny are people plotting to, you know, to slurry the name of good image of India. It's astonishing that the same people who believe these conspiracy theories are also every day telling us that Mr. Modi has changed the image of India in the world and now we can hold our heads high. I don't know, how, it's not possible to reconcile these two positions, but you know, wonders never cease. So uh, in the parliament, the government has spoken of, you know, conspiracy. And elsewhere they have said worse things about the global hunger index in which India features at uh, 107 out of 121 countries. Rwanda apparently does a lot better than us in negotiating hunger. They have a, much, a better rank than us in several years, not just one year. They got even more mad and of course even the UN can be accused of conspiracies because India, which was once 121 in the UN Human Development Index, is today 132 in the Human Development Index in the world. You know, greatest economy, fastest growing economy, uh, you know, all that stuff you know, I mean, you hear it, it's beating on your ears every day, so I won't go there. But that index, we are placed at 132 out of 180 nations. Then comes uh, the World Press Freedom Index, about which I will, if you'll remind me, I will tell you something of my own involvement with the government of India. I actually presided and ach achieved something astonishing. A committee on which I worked and gave a note vanished overnight. Even the email ID has gone invalid. And it's a committee appointed at the behest of the union cabinet secretary, the senior most bureaucrat in the country, who is to take his orders only from one man, or in the present dispensation, from one and a half men. <laughs> but, yeah, but, but uh, so this is the thing. I'll come back to that if you'll remind me. Yeah. And in the Environmental Performance Index, we have outperformed ourselves. We are 180 out of 180. <laughs> you see the depth of conspiracies? So, uh, look, I think that two gigantic stress points I'm going to look at and processes also, two commemorative events. One is a process what happened with COVID-19. And the other is that this is the 75th year of your independence. And something huge is going on about rewriting the story of this country, its independence, its freedom struggle about everything. And a lot of people don't seem to realize that the freedom struggle was also a struggle against inequality, against indignity, against dehumanization. Yeah. A, a, a country whose at the before colonialism, as the whose lifespan, la, longevity was higher than that of Wales and Scotland and equal to that of England. Okay? And reduced to 22 years for female and 20, 22 years for male and 21 years for female at the height of colonialism. Yeah. So uh, it, they're, they're very, very angry about what the indexes are saying. And, but there is one index, but okay, I will come to that too. In, I think COVID-19 was an extraordinary revelatory moment in history. It showed us the society we are. What, they, what it showed us was there earlier also, but this time we couldn't turn our heads away. 
okay i think covid 19 gave us the most searing unsparing brilliant and thorough autopsy of the society we are the corpse is on the table the corpse is on the table and and every and every nerve sinew vein artery every bone organ is on naked display yeah everything all the elements of our inequalities were laid bare on the post mortem table as i said those who wanted could have seen that before this time it became very difficult for people to turn their heads away from the corpse of indian inequalities there is one index you know imagine uh, and how did that whole uh, period of the pandemic and the lockdown begin i run a website called a journal a digital space called the people's archive of rural india we publish in 14 languages our motto is every indian language is my language and you you've got bookmarks and visiting cards there you can go to any of the language sites from those bookmarks please feel free to take them when you wish the the in the uh, the one index when the when the pandemic broke and the lockdown came in on march 24th the prime minister of india made a speech in which he very casually asked 1.4 billion people to shut down their lives in 4 hours and the next day you know of the mayhem that followed as tens of millions of people started walking back to their villages to their homes i love the bleeding heart hypocrisy of the media and the editorials which said why are they going back why are they going back you know our conscience was also touched by the fact that we were losing our dobi our mali our driver huh, our servants our safai karmcharis the cheap labor that slaves for us every day for a pittance was going off and suddenly we were worried about their welfare we never even bothered to ask them about their family or anything when when things were normal we never bothered to ask how are you doing but you know they kept asking and all of them followed the cameras etc followed the migrants till the gates of the city because the newspapers and channels are not prepared to spend money on sending people to the rural areas to the villages to see what's happening are we are the people's archive of rural india we exist there yeah so uh, our our reporters in from chatisgarh to kanyakumari were doing we did 270 reports on livelihoods under lockdown what happened to these ordinary people as we were beginning to do these stories the attorney the uh, advocate general of india on march 31st told the supreme court in an written affidavit declared as of today 11 am march 31st there is not a single migrant on the streets of on the highways of india not a sing- two crores is the minimum number that anyone can come up with okay but not a single migrant on the highways of india the very same advocate general on april 14th said told the same supreme court and they didn't query him on it we have opened there have been opened more than 3782 food camps to deal with the migrants where did they suddenly come from there were none on that street not only did they declare there were none they passed a, a rule a government made a you know a law of sorts no one shall move on the highway between 7 pm 
and 7 a.m. You know what that did? That condemned millions of people at the height of summer to walk between 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. In April and May, it was already 43 degrees in Madhya Pradesh, 43 degrees in Vidarbha, 43 degrees in so many parts of the country, and men, women, and children were trudging in that heat because their government had banned them from movement on the highway after 7 p.m. when it is at least 5 to 10 degrees cooler by the midnight. Yeah. I remember we were doing the story of Jamlo, a 12-year-old girl from Chhattisgarh plucking chilies in the chili fields of Telangana. Jamlo, her house was about 260-odd kilometers from there, you know, and uh, from the village in Chhattisgarh. When the reverse movement started, Jamlo walked with the rest of her tribe, which had been brought there as labor, in cheap labor, almost bonded, and started walking back. That 12-year-old walked 160 kilometers before falling dead. Okay. And here, you know, we were all asking, why are they going back? The correct question was not why are they going back. Why did they leave their villages and come here in the first place? And the answer to that question was two words, agrarian crisis. With tens of millions of livelihoods destroyed from 1991 onwards, what choice did people have but to go elsewhere and look for work? That was, the, that was the correct question to have asked, but it was of no interest to the media. Then, uh, when, by the way, when he stood up and told the court 3,000 blah, blah, uh, food centers, uh, camp, he failed to mention that 62% of all food camps were in Kerala. He made it look as if it was, you know, it was almost as if our effort sitting in Delhi, hmm, that sort of a thing. But, and then, a number of inequalities were reinforced, made, which I'll come to, because there is one major aspect of that inequality. I said I'm going to focus on one or two, uh, on economic inequality today, in this, because I think the numbers I have will, will make an impression on you. There is one index that the government of India is proud of. It never challenges. It's the Forbes Billionaires Index. In 1991, there was not a single dollar billionaire in this country, not one. In year 2000, there were eight dollar billionaires. In year 2012, the year we started our socio-economic caste census, there were 53 dollar billionaires. In the year before the in the, on the cusp of the lockdown and pandemic, March 2020, Forbes always releases its list. By the way, girls, it always releases its billionaires list, global billionaires list. For some reason, I have never fathomed on International Women's Day. Maybe it's meant to inspire you and, you know, give you that aspirational push. You too can do it. Anyway, on the cusp of the lockdown, maybe days before the lockdown, yeah, literally 20 days before the lockdown, it said India had $98 billionaires. That is between 1991 and 2020. That is, in 20 years, we had accumulated $98 billionaires, three one year, 10 one year, four one year, eight one year. But in the first 12 months of the pandemic, when the country's economy shrank 7.7%, official figure, we added $42 billionaires. In the second year of the pandemic, 29. 
So what's that? That's 42, 62, 71 dollar billionaires in 24 months when we had added 98 in the preceding 20 years. Yeah. Talk about making money from misery. It's not an accident that the two sectors that made the maximum number of billionaires in the first year of pandemic were big pharma and healthcare. I hate that word healthcare. There is no element of care in that sector. Hmm. Big pharma, big pharma now has $32 billionaires in our list. And the top 10 of the big pharma healthcare billionaires, the top 10 in the first 12 months of the pandemic made cumulatively between themselves on average every 24 hours they made, they added 5 billion rupees every 24 hours to their cumulative wealth. Okay. Never before in our history had anything like that happened. Nothing even approaching close, that kind of a thing. And the other sector, tech. Yeah. Now all the reporting we did showed us what devastation was there in terms of healthcare access, and there is absolutely no doubt, there is, it is beyond doubt, beyond dispute, that Dalits and Adivasis were by far the worst hit from lack of access to, to health facilities. Simply, uh, and then comes the online tech, another, Mr. Baiju's value doubled and trebled, okay? For the most brainless piece of application I've ever seen. Um, anyway, they made three billion rupees a day. They're the top, top five, six guys in, on average. That was their thing. I asked our reporters, about, to tell you about the Dalit and Adivasi angle, I asked our reporters, I want you to go to areas with strong Dalit population, with strong Adivasi population, like in Maharashtra, Palgar, very strong, Thane, now became a separate district, very high Adivasi population. I said, I want you to online education. Wow, we were showing the world what, it, you know, how, what a superpower or India is with online education. Yeah. I asked the reporters, find me a Dalit girl or an Adivasi girl below the age of 18 years who has her own smartphone or any phone capable of receiving those PDFs, downloading and taking those PDFs. You know, I thought we would get very bad figures. We got zero. And they said girls from other caste groups also didn't seem to have. Yeah? But how did that Adivasi girl cope? Her parents, her, her father, her brother work in the brick kiln in Tane. That girl has to wait for Sunday when big brother or daddy comes home from the brick kiln, beg him for his phone. But a week has passed, it's close to exams, and suddenly you've got to download 200 bloody PDFs. So in fact, you've got to pay 200 rupees to get a bigger package in order, how the heck are people going to afford this? Yeah. What this did, and then remember, Government schools had no facility at all. Yeah. Who goes to government schools, guys? Dalits and Adivasis. 77% of Adivasis children going to school go to government schools. Yeah. And the private schools, racketeering private schools, like in my home state of Andhra Pradesh, just shut down, leaving 8,000 to 10,000 teachers jobless who are now on agitation asking to be absorbed into the government schools. It means that millions of children in your country 
simply did nothing for two years, nothing. And don't think it's only education. You know that one of the biggest programs in this country, Kishori, Suraksha, Yojana, is to give sanitary pads to school girls between the age of 11 and 18. Other meaning of the word gross, right? So you had 160 people doubling their wealth to $794 billion or some such obscene figure. And you had millions of schoolgirls who could not access sanitary pads, yeah? who could not access classrooms, who could not have phones to, in the, actually, migrants from UP and Bihar tend to have more smartphones and internet facility because they've got to send money back from Mumbai or Chennai or Kolkata. They have to have the phone. But when they come with the phone, their children in UP don't have the phone for the education. So we found many poor families in Jharkhand, UP, Bihar, taking a loan to buy a second phone for the children's education. Not many could afford that, but they took loans and bought that bloody phone. Yeah. In the meantime, two gentlemen increased their wealth at a rate the rest of the world could only, you know, admire or depending on where you stood ideologically, admire or be repulsed by or uh, whatever. I don't know if you've seen that internet poster going around. I love it. It says, two Gujaratis are working very hard to hand over all the wealth of the country to two Gujaratis. <laughs> yeah. And anyway, between in 2013, you know, in 2013 BM, before Modi, <laughs> in 2013, Mr. Gautam Adani had a modest 3.8 billion. In 2022, he is worth $128.9 billion, which is, um, you know, an increase. You know how much percentage increase that is? The greatest percentage increase in, in the 2019 to 22 period was Elon Musk, who increased his wealth in those four years by 1,000%. Mr. Adani increased his by nearly 1,500%. From 3.8, you do the math, 3.8 billion to 128.9 billion dollars. Okay, that kind of looting, that kind of money making. Now, please also understand, you can't give me the good old argument of capitalism and market and hard work and everything else because, you know, bigger share of the cake, the cake was crumbling. 7.7% drop in GDP. And yet these people made so much money. It was obviously from sucking it upwards from the poor. There was a gigantic transfer of resources from poor to rich during the COVID, which continues even now. Hmm? Now, all kinds of, all kinds of resources, national resources, properties were handed over to these and other gentlemen. Incidentally, out of our $160 billionaires, the top $5 billionaires account for one-third of the total wealth of the 160. Of course, it's entirely coincidence, it's just pure coincidence, that the top five are all Gujaratis. <laughs> you know, Palonji, Premji, Adani, all from Gujarat anyway, uh, Ambani, etc. Now, when we, by the way, when we hit 160 billionaires, we came third rank in the world. That is the one index that matters. There was no conspiracy there, just hard work. Yeah. The 
you know we used to be number 5 number 6 sometimes we and there used to be these pesky competitors called russia and china ahead of us but after mr modi came we took care of all that you know india first so uh, we are now third you see the, and anyway the chinese took a bath with covid and their number of billionaires fell below us and in any case in any case where the russians and others are concerned i mean people you know because they are so jealous of india they don't notice our obvious moral superiority see russia what does it do every 5 years it sends half of its billionaires to prison we are a mature democracy we send them to parliament as of as of october this year mr adani is worth 128.9 billion dollars ambani 86.1 billion dollars he's fallen slightly you know um, and uh, he was 90.4 in may things happen shit happens <laughs> but uh, i want you to know this when at the gates of your capital city the kisan andolan was protesting how many of your media told you how many channels or your newspapers told you that that was the greatest largest peaceful protest democratic protest in the world organized at the height <laughs> of the <laughs> pandemic prior to that prior to that the largest protest against inequality and injustice was occupy wall street 2011 which lasted 9 weeks these guys lasted 1 year and a week so it means there is there is trouble there is despair there is also resistance and remember that that resistance also came from all of you before the pandemic with the caa protests right yeah that spirit of resistance goes all the way back to your freedom struggle yeah because it's not an accident what were the protesters reading at the caa meet anti caa meetings you were reading the preamble of the constitution though i always keep telling my young friends you know there are a few pages beyond that in the constitution <laughs> worth reading also for example if you were to try the directive principles of state policy i'd be very you would be much the better a human being for it hmm those principles are the finest essence the finest distillation of the ideals and idealism of the freedom struggle that's what millions of freedom fighters fought for and got you there is a continuity in that oppression in resistance in fighting back the kisan andolan could not and could never have and did not end the agrarian crisis but you know what they did they showed us the meaning of the word resistance and that you don't that you don't have to sit and take injustice and inequality quietly your constitution promises justice for all social economic and political and i don't think it was an accident that the framers of the constitution said put social before economic and political they i mean when someone like ambedkar was sitting there you know it was a very deliberate considered choice of words so you had this incredible inequality being imposed in this country how while they were rewarding the billionaires what were they doing with farmers you know with laborers 39 labor laws were suspended in gujarat and up immediately in april and may these were later formulated into four labor codes okay 39 laws were suspended the first people to write 
was Gujarat Chamber of Commerce saying, you know what kind of things they did by suspending those laws? You could force your labor force to work 12 hours a day, setting back the golden standard of eight hour day by 100 years, by 100 years. So you could not only where could you be made to work 12 hours a day, the remaining four hours would not be paid at overtime, they would be paid pro rata. What you got for the first eight hours, the same rate you would get for the next four hours. These were the laws brought in by Gujarat and Adityanath. Okay? Happily passed by the uh, happily passed by the government of India, approved by the government of India. In fact, the one thing that Mr. Modi said on 24th or after Mr. Modi's speech, the one thing he said that I agreed with and delighted in was when they read the list of essential services exempted from the lockdown, for the first time ever in India, they named the media as an essential service. I honestly, Nalini, I said, good, I mean, I'm happy because we've got to go out and do our job. We're taking a risk. Now, one of the things about being declared an essential service is that your job is protected. And in the next two years, the big houses of, of media have sacked between 3,000 and 3,500 journalists, essential service. Huh? And 10 to 15,000 non-journalist media workers printers, every, all those people, compositors, everybody. Yeah. The kind of terror unleashed on a newspaper like Dainik Baskar, which bravely, boldly, and let me say this, with all my differences with them in the past, they stood up and took a beating and are still taking a beating, and the rest of the media, almost to a man and to a to a media baron, let's say, just caved in because luxury advertising had collapsed with the pandemic, private advertising, and government advertising you grew more dependent on. Adityanath, you remember there was one month of fantastic reporting from UP about the bodies on the banks of Sarayu and Ganga. Suddenly it stops because Adityanath and Delhi pull the advertising from all those newspapers. Newspapers like Hindu had already learned the lesson because Ram wrote three articles on the Rafael deal. Right. So they had already been, you know, summed out what, what their place was. But the others found out this way. You are running a country with one set of laws for the poor, the marginalized, the oppressed, the deprived, and a completely different set of laws what your country is today run by a coalition of socio-religious fundamentalists and economic market fundamentalists. There is a heavy overlap. You can be member of both clubs, like good old Arun Jaitley was a fine example, and your one and a half men are also fine examples. Uh, the The happy, this happy marriage, happy union of socio-religious fundamentalists and economic market fundamentalists cohabit a bed which I call corporate media. And that corporate, the media are essential, important in normalizing inequality. In making it look a virtue, you know, please remember that in between 95 and 2011, Vijay Malia was a poster boy. Remember that Harshad Mehta and Ketan, Ketan Parik were heroic. Business India had them on the cover, two hard-working Gujarati boys. The next cover, they were in handcuffs. <laughs> yeah, so I'm saying we lionized, you know, valorized, thugs and crooks and criminals, you know, half of whom are sitting with your money in London and Switzerland, 
And of course, we are going to bring back 15 lakhs for every one of you. Yeah. We never, he never goes back on his promises. So you had that, uh, this situation. Now, in the Kisan Andolan, again, the inequality factor, your media never told you. Remember, if any one of, many of you went to Singhu and Tikri, how often did you hear the slogans at Singhu and Tikri? Ambani, Adani, Murdaba. The papers and channels never emphasized that these slogans were on, and there was a reason why they didn't emphasize it. Mr. Ambani was and is the largest owner of media in the country, and those media that Mr. Ambani does not own, he is the biggest advertiser. Okay? Mr. Ambani does not know how many TV channels he owns. I could tell him, but I mean, he's unlikely to consult me, but uh, I, I, I keep account now and then. All those e-TV channels that you watch, except for the Telugu channels, they're not owned by Enadu TV. They're not owned by Ramoji Rao, not for the last 15 years, okay? They are owned by Mr. Ambani's companies. Hmm? E-TV Hindi, E-TV Marathi, they are not owned by Ramoji Rao and the Enadu house in they were sold to these guys long ago. Another thing that they never told you, so therefore, they're never going to be critical, overcritical of people who are their big, huge advertisers. Hmm. Another thing they never told you, why did I give you the figures of Ambani and Adani? Do you know this? Right through the pandemic, after the pandemic, and the gap is even bigger now, Mr. Ambani's personal wealth is far greater than the GDP, or as we say for states, GSDP of Punjab. Mr. Adani's personal wealth is far greater than the GSDP of Haryana, and their combined personal wealth is greater than the combined GSDP of both states. Hmm? I mean, I. Surely this was relevant for your readers to know. In a fight between where, where hundreds of geo towers are brought down in Punjab in protest, you should have asked, what have they got against Ambani? As for geo itself, for me, I think I remember the 2015 waking up and seeing the ad where the prime minister is advertising a is, uh, you know, a service, geo. You know, the prime minister's face. By the way, the law, Emblems and Symbols Act of India, forbids the use of the prime minister, um, chief minister, president, governor's face being used. But the geo ad could use it. You know, that day I thought that we must change the national salutation. Jai Hind is passe, now geo Hind. The highest number of billionaires now is healthcare, 32, manufacturing, 31, tech, 16. From a very small sector, very large number of billionaires. Um, and worldwide tech and healthcare are anyway third and fifth in the, in the uh, industries of the world. <sighs> now, if, let's see what could we do with a small tax on that wealth. Okay, what can we do? Suppose we tax that wealth. Okay, forget 33% tax and 40%, you know, max rate and all that. Let's say a modest 10% tax. And it wouldn't be an additional tax because we abolished wealth tax in 2016. We got rid of wealth tax. So let you know what, on the current wealth of the billionaires, here is what, uh, 10% tax would yield you 4.85 trillion rupees on which it would generate 17.5 billion person days. It's always strange, you know, we always use this term man days, though most of the work is done by the women. But 
okay whatever person days man days whatever that 10% amount would generate 16 point I mean, yeah 17.4 billion working days and it would mean that at a fixed budget of 75 73000 crores you can run the Mahatma Gandhi National Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme for six years. For six years. At, you know, given the promise of capitalism, I did a, did a little calculation. After all, anybody can do it with hard work, right? Not just an Ambani. So I thought, okay, what happened? Let's take the average, the Aam Admi, Aam Aurat of India, to be someone who works on the NREGS. I think that's a fair, that is the person whom we can say is the average Indian. If we take the Aam Admi or Aam Aurat of India who works on that, can they make, can they make uh, the money that Ambani has made? Actually, yes. It would take a little time. 1.8 million years <laughs> and uh, and but be, be optimistic I mean lo life expectancy is growing <laughs> yeah so it's possible and there's so much you can do in that same money in that same period of the two pandemic years not a single paisas concession was made in to the farmers in terms of guaranteed MSP. Not a single uh, ordinances were passed to crush labor in this country. Buffer stocks piled up at one point in August 2021 to 104 million tons of buffer stock. Do you know guys, you could build, if you put those in gunny sacks and pile them on top of each other, you could build a four lane highway to the moon and back. John Drace did that calculation. Just that so many more bags of rice have come that I extended it to a four-lane highway. <laughs> okay, at least I'm, I'm just, you know, having fun with that number, okay? And out of that buffer stock, what was the first rule the cabinet made when they met in, uh, in May or August of 2020? One of the first rules they made was you can convert uncapped quantities of rice into ethanol to make hand sanitizer. You're bloody destroying food. You're only giving people five kilograms of rice or wheat, one kilogram of pulses, five kilograms of rice or wheat, and you're doing this. Okay? So you have an unbelievable thing and you're going to create hand sanitizer for people who don't have water to wash their hands twice a day in Maratwada, yeah, in Aurangabad and a hundred other places in the country. By the way, I, you should know that it is not an exceptional thing that so much money was made out of the pandemic. I want you to understand that it has to happen that way. It's called disaster capitalism. How many of you, you guys would have been too young when the tsunami struck India in 2004, December 26, I think. Do any of you, are any of you old enough to remember the tsunami? Yeah. Now what happened with the tsunami? And I'm trying to tell you that the lesson is about capitalism. The lesson is about greed. That it's not a one-off thing that someone found an opportunity and capitalized on it. In 2004, December 26, the tsunami hit, it devastated 11 nations. Out of the 11 nations, five had major stock exchanges. India, Indonesia, Sri Lanka, Thailand, and Malaysia. Okay? These were the countries that lost maybe more than, well over a quarter of a million human beings. Indonesia alone lost nearly 200,000 people, I'm told. And what happens? 
within a week of this devastating loss, all five countries, the stock index rises to heights greater than they have ever seen in their history. Because there's going to be gigantic money made out of reconstruction. Right? This, the smell of the reconstruction dollar. And by the way, you can see this after every cataclysmic disaster. Mm -hmm. You can see it with COVID, how all these exchanges have gone up. Please understand this is not accidental. It's in the nature of the beast. It has to happen that way, unless we can decide to make it happen differently. And uh, also, you know, you know, what, what I, I trace it, I could trace it back to, if you go back to 1991, we chose a path of development where we brought in one, the policies we brought entrenched all existing inequalities, gender, caste, class, it entrenched all those inequalities and added newer ones to them and sharpened existing inequalities. Look, even with, again, another deadly index, not without an index, but an interesting thing, that figure that came out in uh, Oxfam's analysis of ILO data on care work. You all know that the amount of care work that women do is phenomenal. Yeah? The care, what we call the care sector, which is not the health care sector, but the real care sector run by women for their children, for their aged parents, for their husband, for everybody else. Do you know, just on the cusp of the um, pandemic, Oxfam and ILO, the figures that I, ILO, uh, Oxfam put out are heartrending. You know how many free hours of unpaid care work women and adolescent girls do in this world every single day? You want to guess? 12.5 billion hours. 12.5 billion hours of unpaid care work is done by women and adolescent girls across the world. And you can guess how many of them are from India, right? I mean, they haven't given the breakup, but see, whenever people tell me, you know, how we are third in this, we are fourth in that, you're the second largest, about to be the largest population in the world, you'll be second and third and fourth by default in everything. But you're first in the way you're exploiting your poor and you're marginalized, the way you're treating them. When your neighbors are overtaking you on index after index, when Bangladesh, which we demonize the Bangladeshis, huh, they're doing much better in their GDP. They're doing much better in their health sector. They're doing so much better than us. In the gender inequality index, only Pakistan, which tries harder, is behind us. Okay. Yeah. Uh, now, you know what that 12.5 billion hours of work every day adds up to in value? What women do? Women and adolescent girls do. And let me make it very clear that within those women in India, you can guess which women get the worst deal. Of course, it's Dalits, Adivasis, and poor obesities. That's, that's, that's a given. You know, that's how you are structured as a society. Hmm. That 12.5 billion hours of work globally done freely by women and girls, it works out to $10.8 trillion of value annually, which is, by the way, far greater than the entire goddamn top high-tech sector of the world. The top five tech companies of the world are together worth three times less than the free unpaid labor in the care work sector by women. Yeah. But women, unpaid work doesn't figure in your GDP, right? It doesn't figure in your GDP, right? Now, for instance, 
And yet, you know, there are so many ways. I, I, I have come to believe that this growth for growth, growth stuff is, it's a scam. Okay. Now look at it. How many men have you seen collecting cow dung? You see only women collecting cow dung. Only women and girls. Have you ever thought how many billions of dollars are saved for you each year by women collecting those fuels instead of which you would be otherwise importing fossil fuels. Okay? You'd be importing petroleum. And it's, I'm not romanticizing it. I hate bloody cow dung. And it is a poisonous thing for those women. In closed, in closed huts, they are breathing poisons more than in a hazardous factory, but they are saving this country countless millions of dollars by that. But that is never going to be calculated because it's not paid for. And cow dung does not figure on the stock exchange. Though a lot of bullshit does. <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe it's a gender thing, you know, cow dung versus bullshit. Yeah. So, but anyway, the point is this, that that is just on the cusp of the pandemic. And you know how much the care work has expanded for women in the last two years. So in every count, you can look at it with Adivasis and education. You can look at it with Dalits on healthcare, education, on any front. Hundreds of millions of people have been given a terrible deal at a time when 160 individuals are controlling wealth close to closing in on $800 billion. This is your situation of inequality and it will spur and move all the other inequalities of caste, class and gender. It is going to make them even worse. I want to end with saying, because we don't have the time, uh, that remember this, your freedom struggle was about battling inequalities. It was a very major thing in that. Hmm. And I think several of you have kindly bought my book today. And I'll seize this opportunity to do a plug for my book. And uh, every one of the people in that book talks about the inequality, the dehumanization yeah, that was forced on Indians. Yet, 200 years of colonialism, 24 famines, tens of millions dead of imperialist wars, famines, pestilence, plague. Yeah? And you go and lower your flag to mourn the symbol of that colonial oppression, the Queen of England. How how demeaning and insulting was that to your freedom fighters? The old ones whom I know who are still alive, I mean, they could speak. They were that angry. They were that humiliated by this. What did we fight for? And I'm saying, go back to that constitution of yours. Read the directive principles of state policy. Read the vision that the freedom struggle gave your country. Yeah? If we cannot defend our constitution, we are in deep, deep trouble. Yeah. I'm saying this, one of the things, and remember this, the constitution can e unite far more people than the manifesto of any individual political party. That is our joint heritage. It's something on which we can unite people. The principles of that are what kept all of us, despite our political differences, within the same spectrum. Okay? Because that's what the older generation of Indians fought for and gave us. Are we going to defend those? In the, in the directive principles of state policy, I'm not saying all the 20 or whatever, there are three, four, the right to work the right to food, these, the right to health and nutrition, if we can make, fight to make these 
a part of every struggle. If we can fight to make those parts of the Constitution, you know, whenever you talk about directive principles, there will be one smart young lawyer who will say, sir, those are not justiciable. I know they're not justiciable here, I can read. But you know what? The same chapter which says they are not justiciable says they are, however, fundamental to the governance of the country and should inform the policies of government. That also they say. The Supreme Court in the last 40 years has passed three judgments, including the last by Justice Ashok Ganguly, saying, the, more or less saying that the directive principles of state policy are every inch as important as the fundamental rights of your country. Yeah. So I'm saying that this is something we can unite on. This is, and look at how the Constitution is being chipped away, particularly on the protections for the most oppressed and marginalized. They're undercutting and undermining reservations. Your EWS is being used, weaponized to, to destroy the other reservations, and you have excluded scheduled castes and scheduled tribes. All this sort of stuff is happening. Please defend, defend your constitution. You really need to do it. You need to bring those de demands on. It's never been easy. It has been done. Look at your freedom struggle. It won't be easy. It can be done. Thank you. Uh